Hi, Deji. Hi, you wanted to see you again. <laughs> Thank you so much for making the time to do this. It's You're really welcome. great having you here. Awesome. Okay. Uh, so before we get into it, can you tell us a bit about yourself, what your background is, your education? Okay. Thank you. My name is uh, Adede Jolo. Uh, I love to say I have two degrees in engineering because maybe that, those are the two smart things I've done in my life. <laughs> And so background wise, I grew up in an intellectual family. My mom was a lecturer. I spent most of my life growing up reading books. Uh, did electrical engineering in my undergraduate and mechanical engineering in my uh, master's. Unfortunately, I've never used that for, for, I've never worked as an engineer in my life, but I'm still deep in engineering. I still follow up the latest engineering stuff in my field. Um, I'm a dad of three, uh, two girls and a boy. So, as of today, I'm 44 years old, if you're interested in that. Uh, <laughs> born in January, spent most of my years in banking, first worked in Star Trust, then Access Bank, then FCMD, worked in UBA for like five years, uh, worked in FCMD, data transformation, and from there, I spent like one year in system specs, and then spent most of my life after banking as a VC, a uh, corporate VC within a coordination group in a company called Triumph. Uh, did investment in all of companies like Sparkle, Light in Israel, and also we built World of Finance. And also, uh, post working for other, other people, I started, I, uh, started working in for full time, January 2022, uh, which is basically something I've been working on for like a couple of years. And then the, it started scaling up and I felt, well, I needed more adult supervision to do things. You mentioned that your background is quite intellectual, your mom is a lecturer. Yeah. Do you think your the values that she passed on to you made a difference in how you pursued your career? Uh I wouldn't know, frankly, because I grew up in the same house with my other siblings and we went different routes, right? Uh I have a younger brother super smart, but we did things differently. He was smart with his hands. Uh for me, um the few things I you know I learned from my mom. My mom was super curious. Uh, she was learning a whole lot of stuff. She loves to read. I took that from her. As a kid, I used to read Time Magazine Business Week. So growing up, it was like as if I knew what was happening in the world. So to today, I could talk about things that happened just even when I was a kid from a very, uh, from an adult point of view because I read all the Time Magazine my mom used to have. Um, I would say one thing I could take from my mom was like my mom was super asset confident. Right? So it means like, Look, you know what? It's not like I don't care about what other people think, but ultimately I know that look, I still need to be able to stand for myself. Uh, my mom was a proper Egyptian woman, so she'd give it to you if you cross the line. And so I will always be grateful for that, right? So I would say, by and large, my upbringing helped, but then ultimately we all went, decided to do different things in life. I would say that when I was leaving secondary school, um, my friends had more impact on me. Uh, I have friends like uh, Daniel AGJ, Leo Gini. Like these are guys that see my friends today. Even after thirty, like thirty-three years right now, we all still be friends. And because we were very serious, I was so serious in school because I thought maybe if you were in there, maybe I wouldn't have done good enough in school. And maybe and if I didn't do well in school, I may not have gone through some of the path I found myself. Okay. Okay, so most of us are familiar with your banking and fintech career. You know, you are the you are one of the few legends that um, have paved the way for a number of us. Uh, yeah, I started my banking career straight from e-banking. So I was called relationship manager, internet banking. And I really love the word relationship manager. It made me, it made me feel very important. Maybe it was I was just a platform assistant, but that gave me my first view into what bank could be, solving problems for others. Then from doing that as a copper, I was in Access Bank, I was in Technology in Access Bank, and landed in a new team called eBanking, and a couple of us came from training school. We had a senior person who was leading the team, and then months after he left, and I was made to supervise my other colleagues as an ET, and then I was promoted and I guess that was it. So I was in IT or technology for like three years, three and a half years. From there, I was also, I was in FCMD. I did most of my career in FCMD was also in technology, but for a short period, I was in finance, which, which kind of helped me. And in UB, I was mostly in finance and then also 
was in uh, digital banking. And that was how I moved from technology to finance then to digital banking. Now, by the time I got to all that, all the experiences I had it kind of shaped me because when I was in doing digital banking, I knew technology very well. I knew the numbers from being a finance person very well. I could use data to drive my business, which also helped me very well. I guess all those experiences kind of add up to who I am today. So you mentioned that you're 44. How do you think that your very vast experience has helped you with your entrepreneurship journey? Okay, so um, I would say I'm highly in my entrepreneurial journey, right? Uh, and in the end, that will justify whether the path I'm taking is okay or not. Of course, usually, statistically, older people are more successful as startups uh, because they have the wealth of experience to judge things that don't work. And then they're also more, uh, less likely to do things that are very rash or get into trouble. But younger people also have the advantage of not having a body enough to take about peace, marriage, family, they're able to sacrifice everything. So for me, I would say it's neither here nor there. And uh, of course, when a grown up uh, becomes successful having a startup, there's no, there are no bells, nobody's interested in the story because you know what? That grown up, if you can't be successful, then what's we'll the So let's talk about your startup, Lens Square. Where did Lens Square come from? How did you come about the idea of building Lens Square? Okay, so I, I guess maybe I'm lucky to have, because of my engineering background, that foundation access to me to understand. It's like Newton's law of motion. The three laws governs almost all the things. We call it the classical uh, physics of classical mechanics. So you need to know from first principle how things work. So if you took Nigeria and say, or if you look at the world and look at the countries where things work well, the average person there has money, access to credit, to be able to do what they do. So if you're in the US today, for example, you could go to the best schools because the only thing you need to worry about is how to pass and get to the good school. If you pass, if you are smart, even if you are just normal, there's always students going to fund that. You don't need to worry. When you come out of school, getting a new car, a new job, a new house, a new a new appliances for your house, you can get the credit you need to do this thing. It's just like having a startup as well. We all know that, yeah, it's nice to bootstrap, but everybody knows most people cannot. And not all businesses can also be bootstrap. You need money coming from investors to help you grow. So those people abroad in all the countries that are developed really, really had access to credit for them to start their life. It's almost like an unfair advantage. Of course, not everybody you give money to will be successful, but if you give money to a lot of people, people will succeed. So in, it also meant that if people in the developing world should have access to credit, you'll probably succeed as well. Now, but unfortunately, ask yourself, if you have a billion people in Africa, why don't they, why can't we rush and come and give them money? But the problem is that if you give anybody money in Africa, they won't pay you back. And it's the same thing abroad as well. If you give them money, they may not pay you back, but there are consequences. But in Africa, there are no consequences. There's no government to any hold anybody accountable. So we thought, okay, yeah, what if there's a technology that will make people to be held accountable, have access to data, have access to technology, machine learning, fingerprinting stuff. But then these technologies are so expensive, it's almost not there. So in Nigeria today, we don't have electricity. Everybody knows if I have a solar panel and it's in batteries, I could be a question for seven life, but it's expensive, so I don't have access to it. So in solving the credit problem, we figure out that look, what if we could make this very expensive technology available to every lender? Maybe that will give them the, the confidence to go out and learn. And that is where this thing came from. Like, let's not solve the problem at the surface. Solving it at the surface means I'm becoming another lender. If I were a lender, oh yeah, I would be a successful lender. I would be a bank or a digital lender. I would be like a carbon fair money. But I would just be one of them. I will not be solving the problem. I may be solving my business problem, but I'm not solving the Nigerian and African problem. And I was more interested in solving that, even though it looked like it was at least an impossible thing to do. So, so basically, that is what made us to start Lenstack before we actually change it to Lens Square. Yeah. Like we started as Lenstack and then we started building. And I can tell you uh, the problem we faced were many. Uh, first and foremost, the business proposition wasn't clear, even though the vision was clear. Uh, access to talent was difficult. We didn't have funding. It, we literally, uh, I was doing the by the side, we literally built and shut down so many times I can't count it. But we just kept going. Like we when I look at the number of iteration we had, 
uh, the first attrition in 2018, another one was 20, early 2019, which backed it, 2019 again, 2019 again, 2020 again. So we actually built this thing like four to five times. Wow. Yes, but sure. we never gave up. On so we built like five times until we finally found something that worked. Interestingly, the first time we started scaling with something that really worked would be uh, September 2020. For the first customer we worked that will work, we started working again from November 2020. And it was even a side project from what we thought was going to work. So we actually pivoted from doing the web one that everybody comes to to start building web. We start, build, we start building mobile, and then those guys start scaling. Then we now back. Like expanded to go to web, and today we have like as of today we have about a thousand vendors on the platform, about going towards like six hundred fifty thousand customers on the platform. That's how far we've come. But where we're coming from is irrelevant. Is where we want to go to. Like this is basically in three years' time, we want less people to, to process like to be involved either directly or indirectly in twenty five percent of all retail credit grants in Nigeria. We also want our competitors to also be successful. Like. Credit needs to be going this way. We need to drive this country forward, drive Africa forward. We want Lenspread to be able to uh, seed the transformation of Africa the same way Telco transformed the African space. Everything we're doing today, being able to speak, you're probably going to put this on YouTube, and people will watch this on their mobile phone, whatever, is due to the few foundational things that are done. The journey is not going to be short and it's going to be tough, but you know what? I'm used to just falling and picking myself up. So we're not going to stop until we reach that goal. Okay, so Lens Square, Lens Park, it's been a journey. Um, but you mentioned that you left paid employment early this year. Yeah. To focus 100% on Lens Square. Uh, how, wh how did you arrive at that decision? What, what made you think? So it was, it was easy, right? Because First and foremost, I believe so much in the vision of what I'm trying to do. And the vision is not tied to if I could do it. I know it will always work. I may not get it to work myself, but I know it's a solid proposition. It's like Shopify for lenders. You know what? Bring everybody in. Uh, today, I was talking to one of my customers. I went to see her in Nikeja, and she was telling me how she went to somebody else, maybe a competition, and it's taking her months to get on board because she has to get something from Payment provider, she has to get something from credible. Like she literally has to get everything for herself for her to be able to move forward. Mm -hmm. But she came to Lens Square and the time knew she was up and doing, she couldn't believe it because we've taken care of all the pain. The same way you, if you go to Shopify today, we've taken care of all the pain for you, like everything is done. That's what we do, right? And that's value proposition. So when we started doing that, I knew the look. Yeah, it, it's already. Product market fit is already kind of validated, but you now need an adult in the room to be able to do it. I was faced with you can't do it by the side. Mm -hmm. If you really believe in this, jump. Of course, I was worried. I've got three kids, mm -hmm. and they don't do promo in for their school fees, <laughs> right? Uh, but I knew that because maybe I use part of my. This is the adult part of me. I had savings. I know that in case of emergency, I could live my lifestyle for three, four, five years without doing anything else. I knew that, look, I had, I was comfortable, right? But I knew also that, look, I could jump because if I, as I asked myself, pay the appointment, good, I had a good career. I could leave Nigeria and work in most part of the world. I could earn millions in salary, whatever. But I asked myself, I answered for millions of dollars if I put myself at it. But I asked myself, see, Leave the money you want to make. If you don't solve this problem, if African problem is not solved, it will not solve itself. Right? This problem don't problem don't solve themselves by just thinking somebody else does it. I don't know what to do for this, but I want African to be okay. Wait, what the worst thing that will happen? We'll do it, it will not work, it will fail, they will make fun of you. Fine. It will be painful and you feel like you. After that, somebody will feel after you and they make fun of them. That's the end. I just say, you know what, I'm going to do this thing. I was scared. I don't. Anyway, I'm still scared. I wake up every morning thinking, what the other man doing here? But you know what? It's what it is. So I'm quiet. I'm just trying to solve my problem. But I'm just there. That's it. But I know, but, but, but you know what? The thing that gives me comfort is I've gone through this kind of journey before in different ways. I've seen people go through this kind of journey before this way. It's always looking like a big problem if you're scared. But once you solve that problem, you discover that sometimes you discover that you are always going to win anyway. 
and you know what? Let's do it. So the work that can happen is to team work. And I've already figured it out. It does not work. What's okay. your plan B? There's no plan B. Nice. Yeah, there's no plan B. And it's just going to work. And if it doesn't work, then I will fail. But you know what? I could look at myself in the mirror. Yes, you failed. But it won't be like failed because I won't. I will try my best. Try. Then I can at least tell myself I can. I would rather. I don't think I want to. I don't think I can look at myself in the mirror and tell that I never tried it because I was scared. No, I can't do that. Cool. Okay. Okay, so you started while you were still um, in paid employment. Mm -hmm. How did you start? What were the first things you did? Um, so it, it's always been an idea I've been thinking about. Incidentally, the idea started like around 2017. It started with, um, there's a guy called um, Joy, right? So then he used to do stuff for me. And then he came out one time, he wanted to do something. Like he had an idea about loan app. And then he brought it to me and said, okay, I'm interested, let's get and do this. But he lost traction, they left. And I asked myself, what if somebody actually do something that allows people to do this without having to think of implementing? Then I first, I got some guys together, like one of the co-founders of Lemonade. And then we started this thing. But then that also lost traction as well. But that thing was picking at my mind. So I couldn't let it go then. In the end, I spoke to a number of my friends, excitedly, we could do this. Early investors four years ago, and then they they are like about five thousand dollars or so. Yeah, and then it started, and then we started building. But my attention wasn't there full time, so it also meant that we couldn't I couldn't provide direction. I practically frustrated the life of everybody that worked with me then because people would come around, they would do something. I wasn't there to provide guidance. Come back and say drop, 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 and everybody was just frustrated. <laughs> And then, but Including then, you. Yeah, but then we just kept going and just kept going and just kept going. And that was it. Like, I don't, frankly, I, I just think I just don't, when I have ideas, I just don't die easily. Like, I, I, I know I have crazy ideas every time, but few ideas, once I'm, once it lacks in my mind, I could run with it for years and years and years. That's it. Interesting. Okay. So, uh, I actually used to run a, and it's a, a lending business outside of out of Excel a while back. Oh really? Yeah. So why didn't you do it on Excel? You no, know, this was this was what 2013, 2014. Are you going to come back to lending? No, <laughs> it's against my religion. <laughs> okay. So that's no lending with interest. It's what yes. you do. Yeah. Do, there's lending with sharing profit. I don't know how you guys can figure uh, that Yes, I, I, yes, there is. Uh, yeah, but if you want to learn, can, if you want to learn to, um, in line with Islamic, uh, what do you call it? Okay. Islamic rules, laws, so rules and yeah. regulation or guidance or whatever you call it, or is it labels or regulation? <laughs> The platform supports you. Just said you're oh. interested to you. Okay, so I was going to ask you actually. Um, so if you know, I had that business today and I wanted to because a few of the main issues were obviously keeping records, chasing people, uh, a million and one things, and even keeping track of how many loans were out. I, I lost so much money. God, how? How? You're kidding me. Wow. No, I'm not actually. <laughs> so. My question is, how would Lend Square today have been able to help me to to manage that business properly? Oh, interesting. So here's the thing, right? Of course, there's always a time when people become bad, but people that don't pay their loans have history. They have they once they've taken advantage of one lender, they literally and they know they could get away with it. Mm -hmm. Just keep doing it. So, for example, if you set up on Lend Square today, you sign up for free, like, and then you can start lending in five minutes. Uh, you set up your loan product with the conditions at which how you want to accept money and uh, how you want to accept customers making mm -hmm. requests for your money. And of some of these guys, when they come in, first we check them on our own blacklist. There are great chance that we've taken money from somebody, one of our lenders before. We have almost a so thousand. So there's a first step credit check. Yeah. Yeah. And if they are taking money from any of our guys, we will never get their loan request will never even get to you. Or after that, we go to credit bureau. And then we we'll check as well. And if I found it, they will never get money from you. But even then, we, we're using um, statement data 
using even uh, new technology we're bringing up right now, which if they're coming from their mobile phone, we'll be able to check them. They will be able to know whether they even own your money. You can reconstruct their financial history by looking at their the data social from their behaviors. Phones. No, we, we actually don't use social behaviors at oh, this okay. time, uh, but it's something we're looking at and doing pretty soon. And with that, some of them, you probably would discover that they are not good for anything and then you will not give them any money. And in terms of collection, those who take money from you, they put, they put in your debit cards. At the right time, we send the reminders. We try to take money from their bank account. Now we have remitter as well. If you are doing large ticket transactions, they put their uh, what their debit on their account. That doesn't get disabled. That doesn't get lost. That doesn't it doesn't have do not honor for large ticket transactions. I would expect everybody to be able to do this. So basically, um, that's that's basically how we do our stuff. Okay. And that so, will help you. Uh, it may not in in fairness may not remove everybody, but we yeah. have blocked enough guys. And you, your business yeah, will have been yes. possible. Okay, so back then there was um, there was a regulation on dot checks, so people actually got uh, penal penalized for issuing dot checks. And then I think now we have we, there's actually a penalty for having failed transactions or having failed debits on, on your debit? yes. On I don't think debit. I don't think that's I think the regulation think exists. It was it was the, issued. So the regulation exists, but I don't think it's being implemented by anybody. Oh. But right now, you know, we don't care whether they are being paid nice or not. Just get some money back. That's the most important. Okay, so that's what I was going to ask. Um, so with you know all of these issues or clear issues, is there what? How has uh, loan performance been? And so how it's, has it's, 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 so it's kind of improved significantly because we also implement what we call partial debit, okay. which allows us to be able to try to get lower ah, amounts if okay. the customer's account is coming back with insufficient funds. Okay, but that's not all. We also have multiple ways for people to pay. So yes. for customers who really want to pay, they could pay back with their cards that are not working. Okay, and uh, so that's it. And for our cards, we continue trying on your cards. Until that card that expires is blocked, or you get the money back. Okay. Relentlessly, there are customers that will ping their account like over 2,000 times. Yes, we we'll continue pinging you until you are tired. I'm almost encouraged to go back to lending. I think you should be encouraged. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you've done a million and one things banking, VC. What, which aspects of your experience would you say you are best at? Best at or enjoy at? Enjoy the most? Both. Okay, I would say I'm best at uh, architecture, like actually, yeah. Software architecture. Software, like okay. system. Mm. Like, I have this product, I want to take it to the market, I want to do it to, but I enjoy product management. Mm -hmm. I, get, I, I enjoy the product, like more like the product marketing. So I enjoy product marketing the most, but I know product, I know the architecture, the engineering and the architecture part the okay. most. Right? Okay. Okay, um, what do you think of being a generalist? Would you call yourself a generalist? Um, I don't know, right? Uh, because I think I'm lucky to know the things I know, I know most of them deeply. Okay. So, it's like product, risk, compliance, everything. I know all these things deeply enough to be a specialist in any of them at any time, right? Uh, but I feel like if you're going to be great at your career, you first need to have a wide base, you need to know as many things as possible, at least conversational or surface level, yeah. enough to be able to drive your thought in where to point direction and find a few silos to become an expert. Okay. So if you're a product manager, you need to know tech, you need to know finance, you need to know operation, you need to know a bunch of stuff. Because those surface knowledge will help you shape your product very well. Obviously your depth of knowledge comes from a lot of reading and a lot of exposure and experience. Uh, but is there anything, any aspects you would say that you're not great at? A lot. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so number one, even though I actually started my PhD in finance, I'm actually not great at finance when it comes to the accounting part, oh. right? Funny thing, when it comes to operations, I know accounting, I can create accounting entries and do it very well. I know that more than most people that I know. When it comes to the accounting part, we are doing uh, trial balance, we are doing, uh, what do you call it? How to do deals and like, okay, yeah, I can design deals very well. I know how to do deals, but those try and balance and stuff and drive me mad, right? That part I struggle with and I run away from them. Um, which other here do I suck at? Uh, some legal parts, yeah, legal. I'm not too 
very good about some arcane part of legal stuff, right? But then I haven't drafted a contract for a long time. I know the best way to draft my contract that I won't die. Keep the legalist on one part <laughs> and keep the meat of what you want to do. And you have as lawyers to help you anyway. Yes, but sometimes, so lawyers may be helping you, but how do you know if a lawyer is self? Because lawyers, a lot of lawyers don't know tech, so yeah. sometimes they're not careful. You need to know that part very well. So law is also a part I, I struggle with very well. But for the other part, I can kind of figure my way out. Okay, so over the how many five different iterations of Lens Square you has the business model changed or has no uh, the business model hasn't changed it's how I'm solving that problem that's changed okay so when I started it was building web application for everybody and say sign up you can start learning and the rest of it right even like looking back none of it works. and looking back I would say that not being there was a problem because the guys working with me, they were smart guys, but if you weren't going to guide them in the right direction, they weren't going to read my mind. Okay. And I was hardly available, right? So which made building that difficult, right? Um, I, th I, th I think that was it. Okay. So you've had to pivot the how, not the what. Yes. Okay. The what has never changed. Okay. So at the beginning, we were building web. You sign up on web and you can do your stuff. Everything together in one single place. We didn't even have decision models. Like all this thing we did for it. When I look back at the, what we are building, we were so Mickey Mousey. I can't just imagine that's what we are building. Thank you. Like I don't even know. And well, the thing is, most of the time you don't actually really know how to solve the problem until you get into Absolutely, it. Absolutely, because things evolve. Now today, so we st we went back and started with building for a customer. I mean, we are building where somebody we agree on. It was. We started dragging from two million, from seven million to two million, and I agree because it cost me like five million even in direct cost to do that yeah. stuff. I just wanted to have a revenue. We didn't have any revenue from when we started November twenty eighteen until November twenty twenty for one whole year. I was burning through investors' money, right? And I didn't have money to hire very senior people, which made it very difficult. So I had this bunch of kids who didn't know left from right, and I was super upset that they weren't going to build. The world's greatest platform. You know? Oh, that they were not really in your mind. Yeah, absolutely. When I could even see most of it in our mind. And so we built the web one and the mobile for the customer. It was good, right? And in fact, many of the artifacts, what we did at that time, to today survived here now. Like a lot of the data structure, a lot of the, even the form field, a lot of some of the, the model worked. Right, we got that right, sort of, because what Apple like, we sat down with a lender who told exactly. us what he wanted. Exactly. At the beginning, we were building thinking. So I felt I knew lending, but I actually never done lending by myself. You know, I sent out my staff to pick up funds from different lenders, looking at different fields. That's what we did. But some of those things really worked the way we wanted, right? And so the model we now do was like, we we start improving our platform for every new lender we bring on board. Mm -hmm. There's a new customization. Somebody was paying for the platform getting better. So we started with the customer who gave us exactly what he wanted. The next customer wanted more. He paid extra mm -hmm. and then we did too. Now we have built a monster like that does everything apart from serving for free. He still doesn't have everything. We still don't have our own statement service. We still don't have good we, they, they, our analytics at this level, I would say, is rudimentary compared to where I want it to be, right? Uh, we are just going into SDK and exploring customers from for more insights. But there's still a long way to go. Uh, there are a whole bunch of stuff we still wanted to have, like being able to capture customers' audio, video, and let them speak to the customer and stuff. So there are a whole bunch of great things we are trying to do, but we scaffolding, we are building on top of each other, right? So yeah, you're right. Like sometimes you need to just look back at because I'm thinking about what we are building before. And I'm just shaking my head like, <laughs> how the hell did you think that thing was going to work? It would have served the no, purpose. No, no, but I'm happy. Because yeah. I knew it wasn't going to work. I wouldn't have started. Exactly. So you know, sometimes you just need some bit of solution and margins to actually deceive yourself to get into this thing. And then you now use pig headedness, goatishness to stay in there until finally okay, somehow solve. The problem. 
in the, by the time you started again and you know started full time in 2020, you were building in response to the market as against building on assumptions. Yes. Okay. Actual customers who needed it, not that I'm building something and finding out forcing people to fit my model. No, I built something for me that one. And that helped. I'm happy about how we've done. I wish we'd gone faster, but you know, for every startup, it's never fast. When you started this journey, what did success, what did success look like for you? It still hasn't changed, actually. I okay. always wanted to say success means we are helping like millions and millions of Africans to have access to credit. Thousands and thousands of lenders. It hasn't changed. Because I think it was even too outlandish to start with. But I just felt like it's a journey and how to get it as that is evolving. The destination hasn't changed. Mm. Uh, if you ask me what the success looks like, I would say maybe have maybe 10,000 lenders on my platform, like 10 million users on the platform, having like 25% of credit, 50% of all created credit passing through Nigeria, passing through that platform one year or the other. Uh, and that true lender that is to lenders that use us mm. directly, or other lenders that use our APIs, or buy now pay later that is also processing to us. Those are the things we look at, and that's what success is all about. So, frankly, we don't. We've never signed out to measure success from revenue from anything. It's always been to wake up and wake up one day and see that Nigeria is a better place. I use fiber in this house. Not every time, but I have a fiber in this house. Nobody has internet. And I look back at a time when this was a big deal. Yeah. And now we just don't care about it anymore. Now you can get, actually get 150 Mbps or so on Fiber One. Right? And I'm thinking 150 Mbps? That's, a big, that's almost like STM1. And it's just 74,000 a month or something like that. It's incredible. That for me is where I want to wake up one day and every single Nigerian Either directly to our platform or to the revolution we instigate and access to credit. Um, so money came, your early money came from family and friends. Yeah, family, friends and food. That's my father. Yeah, because absolutely all the guys are interested in me. My friends, you know, can be very stupid to do that. To believe but in it, you? Absolutely. But then you know what? No believing in anything is rational because once it makes sense to you, it's no longer a belief. When it makes sense to everybody, it's, there's nothing interesting about mm. right? That's it. So believe that's why every successful company always have these early believers that they are not there for sense. They, they, they couldn't see it that it was going to make sense. Yeah. That's the way it is. So a bunch of friends, um, some people drop ten, ten thousand dollars, couple drop five thousand dollars, some drop some somebody in the end of twenty, but I put together like fifty five thousand dollars. That's how I started. The last year when I signed the club my 90 week, as I did a fundraise, uh, started late last year, and then by April I was done, was April or March, a million dollars, and that's it. And I don't need more than that because I'm not taking a salary, I don't need the money, I just want to grow the business. Unlike younger people, mm. right, I'm not looking the because when I was younger, I have done the same thing. I'm super cash efficient, I'm not throwing money at anything, I don't have an office, we don't do expensive things, we just solve problems because we know that, look, you know what? Sometimes, if you throw too much money at something, you get carried away with the yeah. activities, not the results, and we don't do that. All our goals is highly organic, like meaning that they, they are no inflated numbers, we are not buying clicks, we are not telling people to download and install it, they don't mean anything. Every single thing is sustainable, is real. And organic. Uh, yeah. And well, obviously, by next year, we have to be back on the road to raise money yeah. again. Uh, obviously, by then, we are run out of money and then we need to raise money to fund that group. But for for the time being, we're using this money, the business model is validated, we are using this money to build uh this business. Okay. Okay, so um in those times when you had the multiple iterations, was there any time that you were looking at the end of your own way and Yeah, still I mean every single time. <laughs> at that time when we were just always going to run away, then I always run out of money. But I knew I was always going to we sell more house or sell some dollars and mm-hmm. just provide. But I believe in him that much. That I was always going to do that. But somehow we just never ran out of cash. But somehow we were also never wasteful. Mm-hmm. And then by the time we got into 2020, the new lenders we were bringing were charging them money to give them mobile apps. So okay. that actually funded. So there was a the revenue so, line. Yeah. So I think 
cumulatively we might have spent like maybe a million dollars now or whatever. I don't know. That's roughly around that time. But we funded ourselves, we spent money from mm. investors, but we're comfortable. Like I said, I don't earn any salary, so the bonding on the company is not that much. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So Land Square is a is an industry enabler thing, basically. Yeah. But is there any is there do you ever have issues with um other operators or regulators or you know, people thinking that you may be competing with them. So I have competitors like I love them all, sincerely, because I see the bigger picture than their competition. And look, I like was it last week I did an uh, event with Indicina. Indicina, mm -hmm. she's my one of my big competitors. Vendage yeah. is there, Evolve Credit is there, Credit Camp pulled out. I want everybody to succeed. The market is significantly bigger than all of them. Uh, and in fact, the more we succeed, the less we look like, um, like, uh, what, the, the less the novelty yes. is it. So once you remove the novelty, it becomes a trusted business mm. and people are planning for this. So for me, really, I, and I want to work with them because you know what? Their customers are also getting gift of like that, guys. And I feel we all need to create and enable this high speed connection between us so you can look for bad guys. Mm at fair pricing between each of us, right? I've tried to do that. Nobody's listening, but you know what? It's fine. Like, it's fine. I think at one time, all of us, we are all going to come to our senses and, and have that conversation. Understand but that nevertheless, even if they don't, well, my business model still looks solid with others. Because basically, right now, if I have a thousand lenders on my platform, if I, that's since, that's from February to now, I strongly suspect that maybe at the pace that we are going, we will reach, uh, we will comfortably get to like 3,000 before the end of the year. And maybe before the end of next year, maybe 10,000. If I have a lot of those guys lending and we got to a number, uh, where they start protecting each other, it's fine. And I feel like if we continue to improve on our value proposition, we're going to improve it. So for example, right now we have mobile web, we have web, we have mobile. Most of them want mobile, for example, but they can't afford a mobile. But there is actually a mobile live version we are doing now, which is basically going to wrap up your web application mm -hmm. and make it as a mobile. We make it available for everybody. Just so you could actually even do it and get your mobile within your, you just click one button and your mobile will be there. Download it, you can share it and get into a place. But if you want to get into a place, so you just talk to any of our uh, platform, uh, what is customer sources, and they take you there. But that's what we want to do. And when we get to that level, we feel like we have seen a lot of borrowers. We have generated a lot of data to make sense of what we're doing. 